Hello. Hi there. Hey, I'm two minutes early, but greetings. What would you like to talk about today? Well, I'm just uh, curious. Well, first of all, let me give you a background. My uh, call sign is N2AAM. And uh, well, obviously, you see that in my uh, data there. But uh, I've been uh, kind of lurking on the email list for a while. And uh, my background is not specifically in engineering. I come from the journalism and broadcasting side of the house. I'm professionally, I uh, ran a radio station for almost 15 years and been in the broadcast industry uh, since the late 70s. And wow. Stuff. OK, so you've seen a lot. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And, and in, the, in the ham side, I've done everything from HF to the satellites it's back to the 80s. I go back to RS6 and 7. And I'm always curious about the, the higher end experimental stuff and things. So I've been lurking in the on the mailing list, haven't contributed much because, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, I, I like to think I understand a good high-end engineering concepts, but by no means I'm an engineer. You know what? You've contributed an enormous amount by your attention, and it's greatly appreciated. Okay, and by the way, I got to give you props because, because uh, you've done a heck of a lot with the ITAR stuff and things like that, and, and I'm amazed that you didn't get uh, treated properly with AMSAT. I'm really disappointed with that because I've been an AMSAT fan since the early 80s, and that really bummed me out when I uh, saw how you were treated. Yeah, I can tell you from this from this side of the desk, it wasn't uh, really that fun either. I'm um, I'm still pretty befuddled. So uh, maybe in time, it will change. Um, but the results are there, and people are taking advantage of it. We are, and other groups are, um, from Caltech to um, Librespace to, you know, everybody in between. So um, I, I really did expect to get a lot more collaboration and cooperation from AMSAT because it, it, they, they are the organization that would most benefit from ITAR EAR regulatory relief. Oh yeah, definitely. And you would think that they would applaud and jump up and down and so on because. Uh, you know, we, we all want the same thing. We, we want uh, uh, space presence. We want a ride to heal, hopefully, and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. It would be a whole lot more productive to work together and for them to take advantage of the work. Um, but so far, no. Oh, well, enough of the negative side. So what, from, let me ask a couple of newbie questions, if I may. Of course. Okay. What, what progress have you made as far as uh, uh, things like uh, the ground station uh, codex, what you want to use for audio and things like that, or you haven't gotten that far yet? We actually started with a with the codec in mind. Um, and what we've said uh, uh, at like presentations and, and what we said amongst ourselves is no crappy codex allowed. So we've all been uh, a little bit disappointed with the digital, with the commercial digital codec decision to kind of coalesce around AMB um, for a couple of different reasons. The AMB codec was developed for commercial interests that needed to have as many subscribers as possible compressed in a relatively small bandwidth, right? So you, you can see where this is going. Um, if you select a commercial codec like Ambi, then you're going to get the baggage, sort of the technical debt. Yeah, you'll be locked into their their whole deal. Yeah, and they want to squeeze as many subscribers as possible out of the out of the bandwidth that they have, and that's totally yeah because reasonable. it's their model. It's reasonable for the yes. business model. Yes, yes, completely reasonable, and it is actually rational to pick something that's available off the shelf and to put it into ham gear, especially if you're a commercial company that does this sort of gear, you know, the Yesus and, and et cetera, you know, they, the and Motorola, they, they all have it's the, easier, commercial It's cheaper side. to do with the stuff is on the shelf. I understand that. Yeah, Let me yeah. ask something. This, this may have engineering worth, but not. Have you considered the Opus codec? Because yes. the yes. audio is incredible. Yeah, with, it's really. Opus. 
it's really quite good. So, so what we did is we said we're, the codec is an application layer decision. We're not going to design one in, and we we recommend Codec Two and we recommend Opus. So those are the two that we recommend, and that needs to be um, an application layer decision. Meaning that as an amateur operator of the things that we develop, that your application gets to pick the codec. Now, if you really really want to use AMB, you can, or if you want to downgrade your codec to to four hundred you know, uh, bits per second, then okay, you can, but having, leaving that up to the application layer and saying, okay, applications, you need to support codec two at a high bit rate, you know, or something like Opus at a high bit rate, then I or think that you get a better, that... you get oh, a better sorry. quality. No, because the, the voice is the product for like, and it needs to sound amazing. It needs to sound really good. We, we don't have to extract money out of our system as amateur operators. Therefore, we don't have to follow these sorts of rules that have created very low bit rate codecs. Back yeah, to you. I agree with you. Because uh, another thing, though, uh, have you gotten to the point where you can figure out how many uh, uh, megahertz of space you can cram into this thing? Because I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's uh, five gigahertz up and ten gigahertz down, and it's. Uh, uh, essentially not a bent pipe system. It's uh, there was a lot of uh, stuff done on the bird. Well, on the, let's say in the case of the satellite, it would be on the bird, the processing would be done. So uh, it encapsulate all the streams that you send up with the uh, uh, FDM into one big TDMA stream, which you dump down off the bird or off a mountaintop site or wherever. Correct. That's exactly right. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I understood what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, no, no, you really do. Do and 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 this is, uh, you know, I mean, when when we're talking about communications technology, it is an advanced sort of scheme. It's, um, you know, it, it is not just a bent pipe. Uh, yes, it it accepts uh, frequency division multiplexing up, and then essentially, you know, uh, retransmits it. So it's processed on board and retransmits. So you're exactly right. And yes, we, we know that we have a sub band on, on five gigahertz uh, and 10 gigahertz, that's 10 megahertz wide. And so this is actually a lot of room. What we baseline is 96 channels uh, up, which gives you roughly, I think, um, you know, 100 kilohertz wide channel and we baseline, okay, within that 100 kilohertz uplink channel, you can probably easily occupy um, with affordable gear 25 kilohertz. So there you go, you got your 25 kilohertz uplink channel and bo channel bonding and larger, in other words, being able to tr transmit something larger than that is possible. Um, but that's the sort of the baseline scheme. And that's what we tried to uh, de demonstrate like at previous DEF cons before COVID. So to do a polyphase uh, filter bank uh, or polyphase channelizer that shows like, well, this is what the uplink is probably gonna look like. You know, we use a, a, a polyphase channelizer, we accept all these uplinks and, and then process them. And we have selected a, a native digital mode for the uplink to make things a little bit easier. And it's the open source M17 protocol. Well, is, we'll is that the one that the Australians are working on that, uh, what's his name, Dave, you, you, you know I'm talking about, the guy in Australia? I, I I think that you mean David Rowe. Yeah, David with Rowe. With Codec yes. too. Yes, he's in. He's this is he is actually involved um, in the process because the Codec two is his work. So Codec two voice codec is used. That's the codec for M seventeen. Um, and then the rest of the protocol is developed by an international team. The lead of that team is from Poland, uh, Wojciech Kazmierek, and he's uh, th and then a lot of other people from all around the world ranging from, from Germany to the US. So the rest of the protocol, the uplink protocol is M17 and the actual codec that's used is codec two, which is open source. So that's kind of the status of that. It's um, for terrestrial use at VHF, UHF, um, M17 is, it, you know, you constantly hear it as, as 9,600 bits per second. So it's it has to fit within the VHF, UHF rules. Um, but for microwave, we get to broaden that out a bit. And so the discussion is, okay, so we should, should we, should we channel bond a whole bunch of M17, um, you know, VHF, UHF style uh, protocols, or should we just write a new one for microwave? And I think the latter is probably what, what we should do. 
Um, but boy, would it be great if your if your single radio could could work uh, terrestrially at VHF and UHF, and also work for a, a microwave terrestrial and microwave satellite system. So we're we're working really hard to figure this stuff out, and to get a good prototype. Um, the next show that we have is for is DEF CON at the end of the summer, and we do have some LDPC. Uh, low density parity check forward error correction for the downlink uh, to show coming right up in March at um, Ham Expo uh, from from one of our developers, Andre Swato. So plenty of stuff going on for the downlink for the DBBS 2X side, and also plenty going on on the uplink side uh, that leverages M17 protocol uh, pretty hard. So all of it open source and all of it, including the work uh, from David. Uh, and what we're go our goal, um, we had a, a technical advisory committee meeting recently, and we we uh, Voicheck was able to present about work for the 3200 bit per second version of Codec 2. Um, and what we'd like to do is to make it as sound as good as possible. So he presented uh, a lot of of work there on on tuning it up and 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 making it uh, sound as good as possible. Um, so yeah, we're just we're trying to move forward on all fronts to make it, um, you know, sound as good as possible to use open source work all along the way, and to get a prototype uh, over the air demo working as quickly as possible. So that's what we're up to. That is really neat. I don't want to hog it here. I know there's a couple more people that joined in, so I'll just kind of kick back and uh, hang out. No, oh, okay. Yeah. Do you have any other questions at all, or? Well, just a a couple of comments, uh, which this will probably throw you for a loop because you probably have have not gotten many requests for this. But uh, in addition to uh, all this, the stuff that I've been involved with, I've been totally blind all my life, and as a result, I use special screen reading technology to. Uh, interface with computers and so on, special software that allows this computer to talk so I can read the screen, et cetera, that whatever you come up with, it would be great to make sure that they work with screen readers. Yes, that is actually a requirement. Um, that's a specification requirement for, um, for ORI work. Oh, that's great. That is fantastic because yeah. uh, I mean, it just makes sense, right? I mean, any sort of oh, yeah, any sort of innovation or any sort of engineering that that would help uh, accessibility, I guess, is the catch all phrase for it these days. But any of that helps everyone. Um, and you'd be I, I'm sure. OK, so you're probably not going to be surprised. It actually has received some resistance from various groups. Uh, but that's our commitment is that um, that it has to be accessible and screen readers are something that not just ORI and P40X teams uh, have brought up, but also M17 and and all of the other people that we that we have, all the other projects. So because is, it's relatively simple to do with screen readers because all the hooks are in the screen reader to work with conventional Windows technology and also there's stuff for Linux and the Mac even has a built-in screen reader. So the, the stuff is out there. Correct. It is. And yeah, I am in full agreement and we'll keep at it. We will just uh, keep renewing that all along the way. Cause you, you really have to do, you really have to pay attention to it all along the way. It can't be something that you try to graft in at the last minute. It's, it's, too, it's painful and you'll get a not great product at the end. Um, but yeah, it's a requirement for, for our work. That is great, you, you know, because uh, us in the blind ham community have talked about this for years that uh, it shouldn't be grafted on that uh, everything should be worked out of the box. Well, Apple has done that with its products, but I'm glad to see somebody uh, you get it. You apparently get it. That's great. Oh, well, yeah, I, I, if it'd be OK to reach out to you later, just to double check to make sure that we're we're not botching it. Um, that would that would be super helpful. Oh, sure. I'd, I'd love to, if I can help out in any way, but be warned that uh, I'm not a professional engineer. I like to think that uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm a techie because I've been a, oh, you might call me a high-end computer power user since the DOS days of the 1980s and so on. <laughs> but uh, uh, I am by no means a coder, but I like to think that I understand concepts. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, that's the most important thing, you know, the, in my opinion. So thank you. I'll, uh, I will definitely bug you. Okay. And I'm, I'm on the mailing list and I could be, I'm very easily reach, reachable. Thank you. All right. I see Paul and Jay and Andre. Hey, Andre, you have the floor. Um, I, I was, I wasn't planning on talking about anything. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Or, no, just or, welcome. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean like... to put, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> I've already bragged about you because I am really, really looking forward to your oh. presentation oh. for, um, for Ham Expo. The, the work, the amount of work that you've put into the animations to show, uh, LDPC working. Um, wow. Uh, I think it's going to be. <laughs> it's going to be well received and the 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 way that you talk about it like the discussion um that's fantastic so i i don't know there aren't a whole lot of good tutorials or presentations out there about low density parity check which is weird because it's been around for so long and it's so cool but most of the papers and presentations start out with these extremely dense um like equations and proofs and yeah. shit, you know and i'm like i don't know i mean so as a as an applied mathematician type person it's never really been um the best uh experience yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so. I, I, I did i did watch some videos about and you know there's a theory behind like i don't know probability whatever and you know that's cool and all and but I, yeah, I think I'm more, more on the applied side. Like if I understand why or, you know, how it works, I find it easier to say, okay, like for DVB, like there is some concepts of like when the table is, uh, hasn't, it doesn't have the, like the two sections thingy, you know, the tables are more flat or more evenly distributed. But those are, I prefer going for the, you know, this is how this one works. And you know, then you can expand to, you know, whatever other like, for example, five G has LDPC, but I think it's quite different. But at least you know you have one <laughs> um, area that you okay, you know, I, I know LDPC for this. I I just need to find the delta to the other one, instead of just you know dumping the whole thing and say, you know, just fill in the the parameters for your particular case. Yeah. And then you'll understand all cases like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I completely, yeah. I, 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 it took me a long time to kind of make peace with um, being applied rather than <laughs> a theoretician uh, yeah. because, you know, it seems like the theoreticians and the people that know the theory are better, you know, um, and I just like doing stuff. So it's a, uh, you know, you you I, you yeah. learn what you need to learn in order to get stuff done, and then the the stuff that has no application, kind of to me, has always fallen a little flat. You know. Yeah, so, yeah. So and I know. I, I, think... I, I think your the presentation is going to yeah. be fantastic. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Cool. Yeah. Um, I <laughs> recorded many many times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I I avoided watching the thing again because i keep thinking like oh my god <laughs> are you, to... uh, you are you your own worst critic yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. oh my like <laughs> i changed something in the slides and then okay i have to record re-record the screen and then change the thing you know but it has to be in the exact timing right <laughs> uh, yeah yeah <sighs> boy do i understand yeah i get it i yeah, yeah. you should stop like stop now <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah now is there is there so we have a booth at ham expo um which is neat because um they they've they give us a really good deal it's a, a for nonprofits we get a, a booth so we have an opportunity to put other videos pdfs um and and you can hang out at the booth and it's like a little room and and it has has like a background that looks like a lounge it's pretty cool um, so you can talk to people there. You can just show up and virtual booth. Yeah, right? yeah, all virtual. It's really okay. pretty neat. So, so just I'll I'll put out on the list um, all the 
you know, all of the information so that people can show up and hang out and just have a good time, you know, so no pressure. Uh, but if you do have something like a, like a PDF or if you want to put a hard copy of the slides up or whatever, oh, yeah, I can, yeah, just, I, I, just I send it to, to me. Yeah, I, I can do, yeah, I sent to uh, Eric. Yeah. I can send okay, yeah, on Slack yeah, or. Yeah, he'll have that in the, it's really pretty neat. So like for your talk, then somebody should be able to just click and when they're watching your talk there's like a little button that they can click and download your slides and stuff like that but for for our booth it'll that it does it's not connected so if you, if okay. you have want if you want anything to show up at the booth just send it to me and i'll i'll install it um and it, it's, it's pretty fun it's a neat little place yeah yeah i can do that i just i, I just need yeah i'm, I'm gonna export and send you in cool a couple of minutes yeah or any papers that you think people might, if they wanted if someone wanted to dig into it anything that helped you might be good to to put in the booth if, yeah well, you know. what, what helped me was ron saying you know <laughs> <don't> do <this>. yeah. <laughs> yeah we just should install ron in the booth <laughs> <laughs> no, i mean i mean seriously like yeah. <laughs> the, it's true like getting the first first one right um, like I, I remember when yeah when I started I I went I, I had to do like Ethernet um, like the frame check sequence, and the cool thing is <laughs> if I got wrong like the I think it was the frame check sequence like the the whole you know sniffer Wireshark thing just hanged, so it, you know I didn't have any reference, you know that I had the card the network yeah. card that said you know. Yes or no, there was no in between. So it's very, very hard. So like be with Ron stuff, you know, well, I have the result. I have, you know, I looked up into his code and say, you know, why is, is the results slightly different or something? And right. It's, and and actually get a good answer. Yeah, yeah. It <laughs> yeah, helped a yeah. lot. Like oh, yeah. Yes. We should just we should just install him in the booth. <laughs> He's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's still exporting. I, I will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's Just what? It, yeah. Whatever you want to offer people that, that come to to hang out, hang out there, you know, and then we'll it, it will just we'll have a good time. It'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't gotten a chance to install MATLAB. Um, I thought I would be. It, it's now Friday of the week after uh, hamcation. And I think today is the first day I feel actually like, um, rested. Uh, so, <laughs> so I have not gotten a chance to install MATLAB to try any of the, the MATLAB to HDL that we've done. Um, but that's okay because I know, um, well, Paul is here and he can, he can vouch for me that the, the Choco cat has been, um, going through some, some adjustments and some, some fixes and stuff. So, so I think I'll dive into mm -hmm. that today. And then, and I, I did promise on Thursday morning that I would try to see if the um, performance had been improved with Vivado, because I think you were the one that, that wrote in that we, it took two hours to get the block diagram to pop up. And that is completely unacceptable. That should only take two seconds. Uh, so I have not confirmed that that's all been fixed yet, but I, but I will after this meeting. Yeah, 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 actually I think, uh, Paul mentioned something about logging or something. Mm, yeah, there was some sort of weird log file. Yeah, I, it never completed actually. Like I, I, I left. I started like a day, and then just left it. <laughs> and, like, and it never came. Okay, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hopefully it's fixed, and we'll we'll just keep working at it until it is. It's um. Yeah. And, and, you know, worst case, I guess we can go back to the way that we had it set up in the beginning, which does reduce the disk space a little bit, uh, but it is very, very fast that way. So I'd like for everybody to just be able to log in and everything to be, to experience it very quickly. And you know what, if the disk space is a little bit limited, if we have to be a little more careful about like coming up with giant file systems or, or files, then that's ah, okay. You know, so yeah. I, I know Paul is like trying to optimize it to make it do both that we have tons of space and it's fast uh so we'll try to do that but we won't be silly about it so yeah the yeah. matlab thing i was so i was thinking about putting matlab on um 
uh, Karapi, but Karapi doesn't have a radio. So if we want to do anything with MATLAB all the way to on the air, then it's going to have to also end up on ChacoCat, which is the one that has the ADRB 9371 board. So I'm not really sure now, thinking about it, if that's the best way to do it. But if we wanted to use MATLAB primarily for polar code work, eh, you know, there's still tons and tons of stuff to do with just confirming that the forward error correction works. And and having it over the air would just be a, a would be a relatively distant goal. So I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's that's the that's what we're looking at today. Yeah, I I never used MATLAB. Uh, well, I use like Unidays, you know, very uh, I don't know high level simple stuff. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we never really got past yet. You know, writing some I, I think dot m files or something. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a you're on the way. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'm not. I can. When you get to the HDL and you know putting the thing on Vivado, then I can <laughs> help more. But yeah, let me let me yeah. try to do something simple, and then and then show it to you, and you say, okay, is this gobbledygook or is it useful? And and we'll mm -hmm. we'll just go from there. So that's kind of the goal is to give us a good tool to go from from people that are comfortable using MATLAB and doing advanced stuff. Like we have some. Um, an encoder for for M17 from uh, Fred Harris in M in MATLAB. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds like a good thing to try to get all the way to HDL and to go over the air. Yeah. You know, so if another, so I'm gonna that that was what I was gonna start with because it's a script from from someone that knows what they're doing. He's a MATLAB expert. And then okay, if we can get that into HDL and it actually looks like HDL, then okay, then the confidence is higher. So so that's kind of. That's what I wanted to accomplish. And as soon as I can figure out how to install it, where it will actually run quickly, then, um, then yeah. we'll, do, we'll do that. So I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll point you at it and let you know where the HDL is. And I'll let you tell me if it's uh, useful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Because <laughs> you know? yeah. I have no idea what it looks like when it pops out of the toolbox. I, you know, I don't know what MATLAB is going to present to us as HDL. Um, people like it. Uh, but the MATLAB people, this is this is some inside baseball. They they said that HDL coder. The reason why that they do not have HDL coder as a avail as a toolbox that's available for the home license, which is what we were using before. Um, the reason that they don't let you have that is because it requires a lot of technical support. And so I was like, oh, yeah. Why? I wonder. You know, is it technical support that we would need, or is it technical support? For things that we already know how to do well, so the answer will will be revealed very shortly. Yeah, yeah, I th yeah, I think in in the group we have people who know like the sum of parts thingy. Yeah, like, yeah, we can probably ask I don't know a dozen people, but right. half a dozen people and get it. Yeah, yeah. So get we'll the end. we'll try. We'll get the answer and then and then move from there. Yeah. Cool. Hey, uh, let's uh, let's let Jay have the floor. Hi, Jay. Can you hear us okay? Yeah, so I can hear you. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, I sure can. Okay. I, I'm really here just to lurk. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I, I haven't participated in one of these before, and I wanted to know what, what was going on. So I figured oh, yeah, no, I'd just, just pop in. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate your time. I know it's limited. Um, yeah, no, it's just open discussion about anything at all. Um, and I, I, I try to have uh, more of these around the around the clock, um, you know, throughout uh, 2022, in addition to like the scheduled formal, uh, like the technical advisory committee is quarterly, and then we have uh, events with IEEE and stuff like that. But the office hours sure. are just open discussion. So anybody can talk about anything. Um, and and bring uh, critique, comment, concerns, all that. Great. So, yeah, I know we have lots going on. Um, there is there is a lot going on, but it's nice to hear from people chatting about the different topics that I haven't been paying attention to. So, <laughs> it's it's good education. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So, so yes, yeah, so we we love lurkers and um, approve and support okay. all of our all of the lurking and um, and all that. All right, Paul, you, you have the floor. Okay, good morning, everybody, or whatever time it is where you are. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, it's morning here. Um, I don't have a whole lot to report that hasn't already been talked about. We put Chaco Cat back together, uh, and I believe it should be fast unless you use stuff on the big partition. Um, so the tools should be fast because they're on the cache SSD and general operation should be fast because the main uh, the main volume for Chaco Cat is on the SSD. Same with Karapi, should be fast again. Should be pretty much just as fast as it was when it was brand new, unless uh, you use the big uh, directory to store stuff. And we've got a couple hundred gigs right now, but that won't last. Uh, so I ask everybody to uh, be a little thoughtful about how big files get stored. If you have big files you don't need anymore, get rid of them. If you have big files that you do need, but don't have to be super fast right now, then you can move them off to the, the big directory, but probably do most of your work uh, outside of that. So is the, the big directory sort of like cold storage, like Amazon's cold storage? Is that sort of well, the idea? I hope not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like it's, like big things that you don't that don't have to have high performance. That right. Okay. It, big things that have normal performance, basically the kind of performance you'd get on a PC with a hard drive. Uh, that's the kind of performance we can expect out of big, except that it's enormous. So you could store a lot of stuff there. Um, it's not going to be as fast as a PC with an SSD because it's just not an SSD. In fact, it'll be a little slower than a normal hard drive because the array has some redundancy that takes extra uh, steps to, to store, especially, but also to retrieve data. Uh, so if you have something that you're working on that you know is going to be a big write and then maybe not a lot of work on it, you might as well put it on big directly and work on it there. Um, if you have something that's sort of medium sized, maybe uh, a 10 gigabyte thing, like a, a root FS image for the embedded system that we're trying to build, uh, that can be built outside of big. And uh, then when it, when you're done with it, or if you know you want to set it aside and work on a different version of it, consider copying it off or moving it off to big. Then you can always bring it back if you need the speed. Uh, and then when it's no longer of any interest whatsoever, then consider deleting it. Don't delete anything you might need. Obviously, we can, we have enough room to store stuff. And if there's stuff that needs to be archived, I can take, I can do that too, uh, on request. Yeah, that's uh, a good point. I guess I've been kind of stunned at how large some of the files are. I mean, I you know, all of us know that Vivado is a disk user. Um, but the, <laughs> okay. like yeah, and that's known. Um, but actually seeing how large the installation is, is a little, uh, wow, you know, and then the, I, I guess I wasn't really expecting the, the file system builds, the, the Petal Linux builds to be as large as they are either. I'm used to them being relatively small, I guess, working with embedded devices or having an embedded background. And then this is supposed to all be embedded, but some of these file systems and some of the products are, are really large. And I, I guess it's either, that's just how large they are. That's how big they have to be. Um, yeah. Or it's some defaults that I'm using that are not maybe optimized for the, the payload. A baseline Petal Linux build is relatively small. The problem is that we're trying to build in this ADI Kuiper build uh, in order to get all the stuff for the radio without having to think too hard. And as a result of bringing in the Kuiper build, we have everything for every radio ADI makes. And we have uh, a large array of things that they thought would be handy to have in their Kuiper build, uh, some of which we probably don't need. And 10 gigabytes of stuff uh, as a Linux install is is pretty porky. So that definitely doesn't need to be in there on a, on a long-term basis. And Should we it wouldn't ship that into an embedded application, but yeah, as a I mean, development should, step, should we, sense. should we do anything about that now? Like, or just I think getting it, be... it working comes before getting it small. Okay. I agree. Let me, uh, let me say a few words about that log file we were talking about. The, the log file that was a problem for me in uh, 
managing the disk space was not in ChacoCAD. It's it's at the outer layer of the of the host for the VMs uh, on Chonk, the the main computer that runs all these VMs. Um, the way they set it up in Unraid, which is the virtualization software we use, uh, the log files are stored in a tempfs, which is essentially a RAM file system for, for things that don't have to persist forever. So the logging disappears when you reboot the main system. And it's a, a certain fixed size, 128 megs is what they chose. That could be adjusted, but that's what it's set to. And I turned on a whole bunch of logging when I was trying to move files around so I could monitor the progress of it. So every file it moved was a couple of lines of text in the log file. And if you have hundreds of thousands of files and each one puts a hundred bytes into the log file, you can see it's gonna be a lot of writing to the disk. And that blew up the, the amount of space that was allocated for the log file. And when it turns out the way it's set up, when you fill up the log file partition, the next time your application makes a log call, it just hangs waiting for there to be more space on the log file partition. And there never is unless somebody goes in and fixes it. So that's what I had to do to get it unhung. And uh, then it, before it finished, it had filled up another 60% of how much storage was allocated. <laughs> so obviously I turned that logging off. So <laughs> that's not going to be an ongoing problem, but the Unraid is intended to be a managed system. You're supposed to pay some attention to it, not, not a set and forget embedded style system. So I get alerts when anything goes wrong, including things like the log file partition getting too big. So uh, hopefully this will not be a problem in the future. Okay, good. Is uh, Does Remote Lab South know about it? Uh, well, since Remote Lab South and Remote Lab West are under uh, the common administration of me when it comes to IT, then yes, we know about it. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Um, if we can avoid any of this sort of stuff when, as, as Remote Lab South comes up, then that'd be great. Yeah. Now about MATLAB, um, depending on how much uh, copy protection nonsense they've put on MATLAB, it may be possible to do the same thing we're doing with Xilinx tools which is to install it into the tools directory and then use it from either Karapi or ShakoCat. Oh, that would be really cool if we could do that. Cause we just have one, the one, so the license that we have is a excellent one, but it's a discounted license through what's called their startup program. And we have at least a year, uh, which the clock's already ticking. So we already bought the license uh, right, right before we went uh, to Hamcation um, because the, the quote was expiring. So I waited as long as possible so that we could get as much time as possible. Um, and then went ahead and, and bought it, uh, hoping to get it done by Hamcation, but uh, but I didn't. So if we can install it to where it can be used on any VM, that would be fantastic because then it wouldn't have the restriction that I was worried about. Like if I had to install it on Karapi to use the other devastation to not mess up people, you know, to not compete with the ZC706, um, but it could be used on both and that would be ideal. So I'm not sure how to yeah. get the answer to this question because I think we just have to kind of like install it and see what happens. They, the, the assumptions that that both Xilinx with the Vavado and MATLAB with or MathWorks with MATLAB make and almost all of these companies is that they, I think that they pretty much assume that you're, you're installing it on a big workstation at a work site with somebody sitting in front. And that our our the way that we do it with with it being radically remote and radically accessible is a little bit weird. Um, but on the other hand, MATLAB is used all the time in university situations where multiple users are logging into the educational license. And the educational license is a little bit different than the than the equivalent professional license that we have. But the pro license equivalent that we have is also used in these sorts of situations with lots and lots of users. So I'm optimistic. I think that it will work. We just have to go ahead and try it and then test it. Yeah, let's just try it and see. Let's be optimistic and install it in the tools directory when we go to install it. Probably do we, from. Yeah, do we want to use the 2019.2? I think we probably do to make it 
compa I don't know. I mean, I guess we could install multiple versions of it with the license, but start out with the same version that we're using for ADRB 9371 design, a reference I design. I had not thought about it. I don't didn't know that you had to choose a Xilinx version in order to install the MATLAB tool. You kind of, well, you do. It, it, the, there's only certain versions of MATLAB toolboxes that work with certain versions of Vivado. So I think I'm going to go ahead and just back, I'll back off from what we're using with the reference design and then figure out which which version of, I mean, we, we ran into this with the toolbox for for the ADRV 9371. That's what I, I originally installed MATLAB on uh, ChocoCat in order to use Vivado with the toolbox and then rapidly figured out that HDL coder was missing. So that's why we applied to the startup program. And that's that's why we had to purchase the license um, was because they, they punched this one out along with the GPU toolbox and the general purpose programming toolbox and the LTE pro, uh, for cellular. So the LTE toolbox is also not, um, not available to like, it's not available to educational, it's not available to home. Um, so we actually now have access to all of those, including LTE. So if somebody wants to work on LTE, open source LTE, which is kind of tricky, um, then they then they can. Um, so, th so that's kind of why, that's how we, how we kind of discovered this, this missing link. Um, but you have to have the right version of, of MATLAB. And I think I have all this written down. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to make it to where it's compatible with the particular version of Vivado that we're using. Is it possible to have it compatible with multiple versions? Or do you have to pick one? You have to install multiple versions, and that's fine. You can install, but MATLAB is very disk hungry too. Those are large installs, just like the Vivado. So these are these are hungry, hungry hippo tools um, that like to gobble up all your gigabits. You know, um, so we'll see. Well, you know, we'll start out with that, and if maybe I can do this today, I think it sounds like fun, um, and then see see what happens. Okay, let's try it. Yeah, it'd be it'd be good. All right, what else? I think that covers everything that I know of to talk about right now. Good to see everybody. Andre yeah. had to check out so we can't ask him which version of Avado he wants to use. <laughs> well, no, no, he knows. It's a 2019.1, 0. 0.2. 0. 0.1 and 0. 0.2 are essentially the same. The difference between 0. 0.1 and 0. 0.2 is something that does not have anything to do with the reference design, but I think everybody uses the 2019.2. So don't, please don't quote me on that. Unfortunately, <laughs> this is recorded for posterity, but would it, you know, it's just like, it's, it's weird because some of the minor uh, versions from Vivado are, are major differences in functionality and then some are not. And then, you know, it's cause it's very lumpy, like, like a lot of, um, like a lot of programs, you know, um, so it's no, no different for, uh, for Vivado. And the, the it's interesting because 20, it, so it sounds like 2019 is such a long time ago, but in, in Vivado years, it's like last month. <laughs> so you, you have like dog years and people years and you have Vivado years and, you know, so we're, we're solidly in the 2019 camp in, in order to take full advantage of 9371, which is a, a really amazing RFIC, but Wow, you know, then you look at 2021, 2021 Vivado and there's all sorts of cool stuff going on there. You know, with um, like, so, so if you go back to 2019, then I think you have to use the traditional SDK, what they call the SDK to, to target stuff for the processor side. But if you move forward, then you get to use, not Vivace, um, but there's Vivado and then there's the, the processor side. A complete Vitus. yeah vitus vitus not sure how so you know it's like gerber gerber <laughs> you know gif gif I don't, I don't know garage i you know so yeah vitus and and there's some advantages to vitus so uh, so in other words whatever it takes to to make the our cool matlab license work then we'll we'll do And yeah, we can install multiple versions, so it should be okay. There'll be so much math for people to do. They're just, their heads are going to burst. Okay, that's not, that. 
No, it's, it's burst with joy. Their heads will burst with joy. Oh boy, yeah, it'll be fun. And um, yeah, no, and then I've had on the so we have a Trello board that tracks tasks, and it's been super helpful. But like, the the usage has been fairly low because the tasks tend to be high, fairly high um, level. You know, so people aren't using it for like ticky ticky daily tasks, which is fine. Um, but something that's been kicking around on the Trello boards is to actually do more than just prototype up our user interface. And I think this dovetails in with what Dave mentioned is that this interface has to comply with the requirement for it to be um, truly accessible. And now may be a pretty good time since we're looking at over the air demos into end demos and incorporating, and this may actually help M17. So if M17 can get, can start leveraging this sort of stuff for for accessible user interfaces for their work, because uh, just rapidly coming along for VHF UHF, then now may be a good time to to focus some effort on the user interface. That's there's a hard set of problems there, and we probably don't want there to be a user interface true but i think we're gonna to have to provide something yeah that possibly several things that um a prototype user interface would be a good way to develop the user interface api if you will oh which is the core part of the project and then application layer stuff would be written to that api um i'd like to see it it should be possible to build the system in such a way that it makes a voice terminal or a something entirely different, which would have different UI requirements. Okay. Yeah, let's work on that because I think that's more valuable. And it also means that um, it's not closed. Like we don't um, cut, cut off innovation or development that we enable it. So. Plus, okay. you know, we don't want to be identified with our early user interface prototype. I mean, could you imagine if we decided to be compatible with DMR and we end, so it ended up looking just like DMR or something like that. And everybody who doesn't like DMR will say, well, we don't like that. It's just like DMR that we don't want to be categorized that way. We, we need to be flexible and maybe have more than one user interface when we first show it to people. But as long as they all comply with the API, they'll work. Yeah, in fact, that even if they don't comply with the API, they need to comply with the or be implementable within the air interface. Then yeah. it's possible to make stuff that'll work. Okay. That making the air interface compatible with the UI is really the hard part because right? we'd like to. You could, you could easily write down requirements for a UI API that are impossible for the AP, for the yeah, air interface to support. Like it should be instantaneous. It's not going to be. No. <laughs> Because <laughs> there's this little thing about the speed of light that we have to comply with. <laughs> yeah, physics. It's the law. Yes. <laughs> right. Okay. I know that we have some work in this category, and I don't think it's done. So maybe some meetings or some publishing would would be timely. I think it would probably help because there's. For any multifaceted, big, sprawling thing, you know, um, you got to do the round robin and go check and see what needs attention. And I think this part uses deserves and needs some attention. Yeah, it, if nothing else, to avoid making the the initial demos boring. <laughs> you know, as I as I've said many times before that there's only ever been one good communications demo and it was done by Alexander Graham Bell and we've been repeating <laughs> the same demo over and over again ever since it does get kind of dull um, and if all you have is uh, a couple of screens and you can point at them and say look this that one's talking to that one uh, okay that's the same demo again but uh, it'd be nice to have something a little flashier yeah any along those lines any any thoughts about um well, I guess we it's hard to do demos for Ham Expo because it's a virtual event and has a booth and and all. And we've done in the past, we've just shown off like, okay, well, here's our current FPGA usage. 
you know, or here's a video of Alexander Graham Bell again, you know, but for in-person <laughs> events, the next one is, is DEF CON. And any thoughts on what we might want to do for that? Well, <laughs> what we might want to do, what we might be able to do might be uh, overlapping, but not contiguous. Right. Um, I don't know how much to bite off for that particular six month sprint. Yeah, I'm, I like the idea of video like the, and, and we got a, we got a thumbs up on um, essentially broadcasting the, the talks from the village that we're at to the back, you know, we're at RF village, radio frequency village, and then being able to having essentially the, the, the thumbs up, like, yes, as long as you don't look like you're a bunch of professional AV people, um, then yeah, you can, you can do this and, you know, transmitting the, the video from one village to another using the things that we've written, you know, so it'd be an over the air demo of, of what we do from one village to another. And that's a really great goal, I think. And, you know, video, would be, video plus audio plus, um, you know, metadata plus whatever, um, all sorts of channels, that, that'd be fantastic. But like just, just audio would be good too, or just video, video plus audio. I think video is really kind of a killer app for this, but yeah, because it's speaker. Yeah, audio is pretty hard to share in any of those rooms at DEF CON. It's, it's either loud because everybody's mm -hmm. talking or it's relatively quiet because somebody's talking and everybody else is supposed to be quiet. So yeah. you can't really blast out a speaker with a lot of right. audio. Yeah, I think a video link would be the minimum viable product for, for this. And it'd be nice to, okay, so if we can get that working then and add more to it, um, you know, some sort of like statistics from the CTF as a sub channel would be pretty cool. Or yeah, whatever. that would be cool. If we could remote their scoreboard to different places in the con, that would be fun. Yeah, it would. That might actually be more useful in terms of a video, but no audio demo than the speakers. Yeah. Which are, I mean, there's the speaking track is, is not, it's like, it's most of a day. You know, it's intermittent, I mean, though. It's it, but it's intermittent. So, so it's, um, so it's a good thing to like pop up, you know, so you, again, a user interface and usability challenge that, that I think we would relish to have, but first also, we have also a coordination challenge. If we want to get the scoreboard information, we're going to have to coordinate with the CTF people. Correct. Get a feed. Plus it'd be nice if we could get early access to the floor plan so we could find out whether ham radio village is even going to yes. be within RF range of the RF yeah, village. I asked and um, we won't know for months was the answer. So we'll just plan for same building because looking back over previous years, um, same building, same floor has been the case. So um, last year- But we're in a totally different facility this year. I mean, we kind of are. Into the new Caesars. We are, that's true. Um, but I think it'll all be within, if, if it's if it's in the new Caesars, then it's all in the same building and it's gonna be all in the same conference center. So, so I think it's gonna be all in the same floor. And that's good enough for me. I think we can start to, it will, as soon as we know a link budget, or as soon as we know a floor plan, then we know a link budget, and then we know what we have to deal with. But in between now and then, I think we have to work really, really hard on making this stuff work over the air. Yeah. And so all of the problems that we're working on right now will help. So I, I think we're on the right track. I think so. All right, floor floor back open to any other questions or comments. Well, we had a really good time at Hamcation. Um, it, for amateur radio themed shows, it's it's I think my favorite. Um, and we we ran a uh, a track for on Friday, almost all day. We had all the slots except for one on Friday. We were able to follow Oxcom and a great presentation from them. 
Uh, so we had presented a variety of our work on Friday. I was able to speak in the technology track at the ARL Expo on Thursday, immediately before the show. And it was super fun and the audience was great. And I got to show off uh, what we did, um, you know, and talk about sort of an intuitive approach to digital communications. Um, and then Saturday all day at the booth was really remarkable. We talked to so many different people. Um, in general, the show was extremely well attended on in the morning. Uh, there was a, a real good crowd in the morning and then lunch dipped a little bit and then the afternoons were lights. On Sunday, it rained, uh, so it's a real ham fest when it rains. Um, and we we had a good crowd at the end for the the prize drawing, and uh, well worth going to. Wonderful to be beside M17, so they had a booth uh, to our left, and then Tapper had a booth to our right. Beyond Tapper was uh, Society for Amateur Radio Astronomy, which we are working with to try to figure out how to set up an interferometry system at Remote Lab South. And the advice has been fantastic. And there's lots of people that know lots of things about practical interferometry uh, and bringing it uh, to the public and citizen science. Um, so over over the course of the next year, we'll be we'll do doing a lot of that. Um, yeah, so it was a good show. It's coming back from from COVID and um, was was really well run. The organizers were very supportive and responsive, and we gave away a ton of t-shirts and lab coats and other items at the prize booth at Hamcation. So since we were right by the prize booth and the floor, we got to actually see people picking up the tie-dyed t-shirts that we ordered um, for, for and donated to the uh, for prizes. And the response was really uh, quite positive. We gave away patches and pins and had lots and lots of good conversations. So that was a it's the first show I think that we've done in two years. And the um, one of the fun things that happened is that our booth, which has been in two shipping containers um, for two years, when we set it up, the magnetic panels, the graphic panels uh, refused to uncurl. Yeah, there's the shirt. <laughs> That's one of the shirts that we gave away. It was uh, lots and lots of those are out in the world uh, living their best lives right now. Um, and there's more available through the gold medal ideas store. So we get a cut of that. It helps us raise funds and continue doing the work that we do. Uh, but the, yeah, those poor little graphics panels, um, were curled up. So we had to secure them, uh, convince them to behave with a little bit of gaffer's tape. Uh, but after we did that, it worked out. Okay. So yeah, being curled up in the containers for two years had an effect. <laughs> And we actually had to read the instructions on how to uh, um, disassemble and and pack, repack the booth. So it's been a, been a while since the yeah, volcano. Yeah, had to do that booth. every time. Okay, well, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're looking for the next time the booth will make an appearance will be at DEFCON at the in, in August, um, and there'll be lots more about that on the uh, on the list. So anybody that that can come to Las Vegas, yes, it's a it's a, a big trip and an expense and all that, but if, if you're in Las Vegas in August, then um, we will have, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be at DEF CON, we'll be in the RF Village and helping out a variety of projects and installations, exhibits and experiments. Um, and we, so we should have, have plenty of, um, of presentations and recordings and, and uh, sort of live experiences from that. Cool. Okay. Well, I'm going to close the meeting unless there's any last remarks or, or requests or comment or critique. All right, cool. Thank you for coming to the office hours and we'll, we'll do this again. Uh, I try to, I'll try to do this uh, at least once every couple of weeks uh, in 2022 uh, or upon request and anybody can do an office hours if they want to. Uh, just get in touch and we'll coordinate uh, for outreach to your particular project or your particular particular area of interest. Uh, so we're we're here to support open source research and development for amateur radio. So if you know of a project that uh, might want to come on board and needs a little bit of support, then that's what we're here for. All right, until next time. Bye.